Good afternoon, everyone. It's just after 3 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. We might still have people trickling in, but um, I think we should go ahead and get started. We have a different sort of a lecture today, really not a lecture at all as part of our series. Um, as you know, we're celebrating four, uh, I was about to say 400, oh my goodness, four... <laughs> 40 years of the Fairhaven Lecture Series. So in this series, we bring our faculty, staff, and sometimes students over here to do presentations on some of the work they're doing uh, across town at, uh, on the Whitewater campus. And so today we have a kind of special, kind of a different sort of lecture. It's actually a performance by um, members of the, the award-winning uh, forensics team. It's our public speaking team. And you might remember uh, the, present, the, the coach of that team, are you called a coach? Okay, okay, the coach of that team, Brian Shannon, he was here a couple weeks ago. I'll go ahead and introduce him, and then he's gonna introduce um, each student who will present. Um, I'm Carrie Bourne, as you know, I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we partner with Fairhaven Senior Services to bring you programs like this, and have done so, like I said, since 1983. Um, but I'm gonna pass the mic on to Brian Shannon. He's a lecturer of communication at UW-Whitewater. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in communication and Master of Science and mass communication from UW-Whitewater. He teaches courses in media production, history, film, and media effects. In addition to teaching, Brian coaches the university's award-winning competitive speaking team. Please welcome Brian Shannon. Thank you so much. Uh, as Carrie said, my name is Brian Shannon. Um, Probably the highlight of my job uh, beyond teaching is getting to work with a passionate group of students with competitive public speaking. Uh, yes, I realize what I just said. Uh, most of you are probably like, I would rather not get up in front of people and speak, let alone competitively, uh, but I get to work with these students each and every day, and we're gonna give you just a small sampling of what our students have been working on. Uh, some of these ideas started generating in the summer um, and will conclude in April um, at nationals. Uh, so throughout the course of the season, students develop and, and build up their pieces. So the first performer today is going to be Kensington Narcus. She is our senior leader and team president, uh, and she's going to be giving her persuasive speech. Uh, persuasive speaking is intended to get students out and trying to utilize different persuasive tools in order to convince the audience to take some form of action, to maybe retool their thinking a little bit about uh, the, whatever topic it is. And so uh, they'll break down what the issue is, uh, maybe what are some of the things that are leading to that problem, and then finally pose some solutions to the, at the end of the speech. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Kensington. You good? Yeah, you're good. Okay. No, you're not. <laughs> Abe Volker said his home turned upside down by factory farms as his parents had been pushed to close the dairy farm he grew up on in northern Wisconsin because the difficulties in competing with factory farms finally caught up to them. Though he moved away from the farm, he enjoyed coming home for the holidays to help his parents and brother with the work and is mourning his childhood memories on his family farm. He sadly knew this was always a possibility. With the difficulties in the farming industry, especially as factory farms have gotten bigger, pushing smaller family farms out of business. The farm was woven through all aspects of his family's life, making him feel part of his family dies with the farm. He's not the only one to be affected in Wisconsin. As Wisconsin Public Radio, March 2nd, 2022, notes a Wisconsin dairy farm closes every day. There are more closures in 2020 and 2021 than the previous six years prior. Other states, not doing much better. Factory farms are not just devastating emotions in rural communities. The ACPA notes animal agriculture makes up nearly 15% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. With factory farms' excessive manure use, feed crop production, and intensive confinement of animals, while being largely exempt from federal and state air and water pollution regulations. The Guardian on May 22, 2023, notes rural communities are often forgotten in the media and in our lives. Why is it that the voices of the people who grow our country's food are not heard? We all know the factory farms are not good, but the media focuses on only the animals, not the communities around them. Factory farms are devastating rural communities. It's time to put an end to this humanitarian crisis. 
to understand, must examine the background, effects, and solutions. As Representative McGovern states, corporations running factory farms are making record profits by dodging their most basic responsibilities. Abe Volker's reminiscing on his life on his family farm makes him disappointed the children in his family today not have the opportunities he had growing up. To understand why, let's look at the background of factory farming, with its introduction, where it is today. Initially, factory farming, just like a lot of things in the United States, it brought back to corporate greed. The Factory Farming Awareness Correlation on January 11, 2022, officially defined factory farming as intensive industrial agriculture that is used to widely maximize efficiency. It started with innovations with transportation and refrigeration in the early 1900s. Innovations included mechanized slaughter, synthetic fertilizers, and antibiotics in feed. Factory farms gained preference as the United States rushed to meet its food demand, while generational family farms left behind. This has resulted in 90% of all farmed animals globally spending their lives on factory farms. Today, corporate greed has laid waste to rural America. Food Revolution Network on March 1st, 2023, discusses the effect the often faceless multinational corporation has on rural America. While reaping record profits, these corporations do not support the local economy, local food security, community-supported agriculture. Additionally, any effort by these corporations tends to end in greenwashing, misleading marketing to try to convince others they are environmentally friendly, rather than fixing a problem. For example, Forbes on March 8, 2023, notes one company feeds cows red algae to reduce cow methane by 80%. This sounds great. Before it's revealed, it's only used in feedlots. The cows are for the last months before they are slaughtered. By that time, the cow would have already released nearly 90% of the methane released in their entire lives. Even if used for their entire lives, cows would likely adapt and return to producing high amounts of methane, by adding more positive marketing and positive environmental effect. Barb Kalba, coming from five generations of farmers, started a farm with their husbands surrounded by the same story of small family farms. Now, decades later, they're the last family living on the land as he watched in horror as every other family farm got picked off by factory farming. This shows us two effects, loss of rural culture and health impacts. Initially, losing a family farm is more devastating for a rural community than losing a family business. Wisconsin Public Radio, March 2nd, 2022, notes when many family farms leave in little time, schools lose students, main street businesses close, and families leave. Gutting a tax base of an already struggling community will gutting the community aspect right along with it. Of the culture and support that surrounds family farms, many are deciding to call it quits as they don't feel the connection anymore. A snowball effect, ulting an even harsher depopulation. University of New Hampshire on March 2nd, 2023, notes when this many people leave a rural community, mixed challenges maintaining critical infrastructure needed to provide health care, education, and a viable economy, leaving the people who just wanted a community left behind to rot. Additionally, factory farms are not just devastating emotions, but also the health of those in the communities they invade. World Animal Protection in April 2023 published a study on the antibiotics factory farms use to control the spread of disease while compacting animals together in small areas. Study found factory farms use an estimated 73% of the world's antibiotics, typically on healthy animals. This excessive use of antibiotics creates drug-resistant bacteria that contaminate our environment, spread rapidly in cramped conditions. Study found nearly 1 billion people died in just one year from the four most common superbugs coming out of factory farms. It's on course to double by 2050. Factory farms will create super spreader environments if it means more profit at the end of the day. Jim Goodman spent his adult life caring for 45 cows, hoping to pass his joy down to the next generation. This was sadly brought to halt when he was forced to sell for a multitude of reasons, including the cheese factory he was selling to losing market share because of the cheaper products larger factory farms are able to produce, bringing them to not be able to buy his milk anymore. This shows us the need for two solutions, both a legal and personal level. Initially, we must push for legal action to stop this rule of factory farms. The ACPA has been working on supporting bills that do just that. 
These include the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act, Farm System Reform Act, and Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act, all of which work to hold factory farms accountable for their actions and help smaller family farms. To help support these, we can either contact our state representatives, who can be easily found at congress.gov, so state legislator websites, or donate to the ASCPA so they can support more actions like these. Additionally, we must be supporting our own local farmers in our own local communities. From farmers markets, grocery co-ops, community organizations, there are a number of ways to get involved. The studies have found that grocery co-ops, after five years, 80% are still open, compared to only half of their small business counterparts. In the town of Whitewater, we have been working on establishing a co-op or setting up to break ground next June. Also, visit your local farmers markets. Fresh produce, to fun crafts, there's something for everyone. Though prices may be higher, the money stays local, helping local communities rather than powering corporate greed. So today, we have examined the background, effects, and solutions to factory farms effect on rural America. The millions of people in these rural communities, including Abe, Barb, and Jim, do not deserve to have their community taken away for corporate profit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, we are going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, forensics is broken down into three kind of main areas. The first we call public address, like the speech that you just saw from Kensington. The second one we're not going to show off today is known as limited preparation, where students have a short period of time, sometimes as short as a minute and a half, to produce a five to seven minute speech. And then the third type is called interpretation, where the students will take literature from other sources, can be anything from news articles, podcasts, monologues, you name it, and then put their own message behind it uh, to tell the story. So they take someone else's words and then put their own emotion and their own um, advocacy behind it. And so performing their prose interpretation is a sophomore on the team, Megan Ale, who last year at Nationals had quite uh, the end to our season, making the top 48 in the nation in not only one, but two events. So with that being said, I will hand it over to Megan. When I was a kid, all I wanted was my older brother's love and attention. But instead, I was a constant bag for him to punch. Of course, this wasn't always the case. There were some happy moments. But for the most part, I, I hoped, I dreamed for someone or something to teach him a lesson for treating me so horribly. A, a swift dog attack, a swat from my father's belt. Something. Anything that would end the constant onslaught I endured for simply being born. As I aged... I'd figured out that I'd come along and pissed him off. He was the baby of the family for some seven odd years until our parents broke their promise and had another kid. When uh, this bouncing baby girl came along, I dethroned him. I relegated him to the middle child role. I like to think that this was the first nail in my older brother's coffin. Sibling survivors of suicide loss found that each year, 25,000 individuals will become sibling survivors of suicide. These survivors often experience reactions of PTSD, depression, grief, and anxiety. On September 20th, 2020, my younger sister attempted to commit suicide. It was on a school day right after I'd left her home alone for not being ready. It took me two years to realize that it was not my fault she chose to make that decision. Her therapist told me she would have done that the first second she got the chance, whether it was that day or a week from then. What really happened when my older brother committed suicide by Rhonda Frankhauser. Nail two came when he started hiding his feelings of dissatisfaction in drugs and alcohol. So cliche, I know, but it's the truth. My brother felt like he was never truly enough. 
though he'd failed miserably with his first marriage. He was never a good father to his two sons. He'd redeemed himself entirely in his last marriage. He was a doting, loving father to his adorable adopted daughter. His loved ones breathed a sigh of relief that we could finally stop worrying about him all the time. Never let yourself get fooled like we did. That lasted 20 years. One fateful night, excitement reared its ugly head again in the form of a new, very lethal relationship. This devil, as we came to know her, enticed his emotional demons. She experimented with prescription and street drugs, and she encouraged him to do the same. He was searching for his, his long-lost youth. He wanted to rekindle that virility he once had. It was the beginning of the end. I only detail the downfall so you can know the signs, too. Complete euphoria, followed by soul-sucking failure when he couldn't keep up, was a sign. I mean, duh, right? The family watched as he laughed too hard and smiled too much. Denial and hope blinded us. It blinded us to the fact that his behavior wasn't, wasn't right, wasn't rational, wasn't reasonable. But my brother was having fun. So how could we care? I still remember the night I got the call. My husband and I had just moved into a new place, so we were exhausted. I shook my head no when he handed me the phone. It's your dad, he said. Now, I love my father beyond all beings, but I just didn't have the energy to talk to him for 30 minutes that night on the phone. Tell him I'll call him in the morning, I pleaded. You need to talk to him, Rhonda. Something is wrong. My husband never calls me Rhonda. The hitch in my dad's voice was all I need to know that something catastrophic had happened. Who is it? What's happened? I slid down the wall, bracing myself for the worst, but I, I still wasn't prepared. I just got a call. They say that your brother committed suicide. You know, my father, this man I, I've known my entire life, someone I've never once seen cry, dissolved into tears. You know, I, I can actually hear the guilt choking him over the phone. We'll be right there. I said the words, but my mind was numb. Completely and utterly numb. I don't even remember hanging up the phone or, or my husband half carrying me to the car. The lousy pizza that we'd stuffed down for dinner was in my throat. I wrapped my arms around myself, clenched my stomach, and cried. Six months before my brother unceremoniously hanged himself, he'd unselfishly walked our mother through her hospice journey. Our family had allowed him to take charge to Make amends for all the worry he'd caused her over the years. It'll be healing, we said. We were wrong about this as well, it turns out. To say that my brother and my mother were close is a, 
ridiculous understatement. She believed in him like no one else. She gave him chance after chance after he'd burned every other bridge. He was her precious, sensitive, golden child. He took care of her to the bitter end. When my mother died, I think a part of my brother died with her, you know? The only person that had cherished him for simply being alive was gone. I believe this was the last nail in my brother's coffin. After one last fight with the devil, my brother was desperate for relief. He crawled out of bed. He snorted a speedball. And he closed himself in the garage. He called no one for help. He left no note. A friend found him dead at the end of the rope later that night when he opened the garage. You know, in the end, it was my brother's decision to take his life that night. Even if depression and sadness helped him tie the rope, it was my brother's decision. It's been five years since my brother's death. I've spent those five years going to therapy and researching and soul searching. And I think what I feel now is relief. Relief for my brother, that he no longer has to suffer from the ever-present demons that plagued his life. And really for our family members who have finally overcome their guilt enough to release my brother's soul back into eternity. I find comfort in knowing that my brother no longer has to suffer daily and the demons of his faked happiness. Next up, we're going to return over to the world of public address and the tip, your more typical type of speeches with an informative speech. Uh, unlike its persuasive counterpart, informative speeches are meant to teach and explain. I like to say this is where I get to learn things that I never thought I would learn before. I even got to learn once that uh, there is actually wars over sand because there's not enough good construction sand out there from this category. So giving her informative speech today is freshman Emily Empey. A couple of weeks ago uh, at her very first ever in-person college tournament, Emily was crowned tournament champion in informative speaking. So without further ado, we'll welcome Emily to the floor. Okay, are we good? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. It's September 1st, 1914, and the day appeared normal for those at the Cincinnati Zoo, until it wasn't. The Cleveland Museum of Natural History states that at 1 p.m., Martha the passenger pigeon was found dead on the floor of her enclosure. With her, the entire passenger pigeon species. Once darkening the skies and their flocks of millions just a mere century prior, these majestic birds would never be seen again. It is a very real, sickening, and permanent outcome for many species. However, it may not be that way for much longer. Up-and-coming genetic company Colossal Bioscience believes that they have successfully found a way to reverse the effects of extinction through a genetic manipulation process referred to as de-extinction. Leading scientists who commented to the New York Times in 2020 reveals that approximately 30,000 species are driven to extinction annually. This is equivalent to six every hour. If trends continue, the World Animal Foundation 2023 believes that half of all species could be extinct by 2050. 
from birds to mammals, the planet could appear barren because humans believed profiting off of the land was more important. However, de-extinction could provide these species the second chance they deserve after being wrongfully erased, creating a real-life Jurassic Park. To understand this, we must analyze some background information, advantages, and implications, because as colossal bioscience in 2023 claims, it is our responsibility to fix what we ruined in the first place. The passenger pigeon is one of the hundreds of species that have been erased because of human greed, but de-extinction could allow them to finally live out the time that was originally allotted to them. To fully understand this concept, we must first analyze some background information, specifically its history and the procedure that will be utilized. First, de-extinction has been around far longer than we realize. Originally referred to as Resurrection Biology, Britannica, last access in September 2023, reveals that the first de-extinction attempt was in 1996 with the cloning of Dolly the Sheep. While cloning has been proposed for de-extinction, to truly be successful, it requires a living animal to extract DNA from and house a fetus, making it a more viable solution for endangered species. The first true de-extinction attempt was in 2009 with the Pyrenean Ibex, through a technique known as SCNT. This experiment was a failure, as the animal died within minutes due to a severe lung defect. However, it provided the necessary proof that de-extinction was a possibility. Science Alert on January 23, 2017 reveals that as many as 25 species have now been proposed for de-extinction. Second, there are a couple of routes that Colossal can take, including backbreeding and cloning. The path that they have chosen to utilize is known as CRISPR. Cleveland Clinic, on April 25, 2023, describes CRISPR as a gene editing technique traditionally used in medicine. When used in recreating the woolly mammoth, for example, CRISPR would work like this. After extracting well-preserved woolly mammoth DNA, scientists will create a synthetic gene sequence that is inserted into a strand of RNA. This sequence will only contain traits linked to cold resistance. The RNA will then be inserted into the embryo of the mammoth's closest living relative, the Asian elephant, where enzymes will immediately begin changing the DNA to match these new traits. Once developed, the embryo will be inserted into a surrogate before it is born a woolly mammoth, or the closest we can get with the current DNA samples and technology that we have. It's a lengthy process. Scientists would also require a different approach for egg-laying creatures, making it even more complicated. However, Colossal believes that it is worthwhile. The company describes many advantages, including being used as a carbon reduction tool and an animal restoration tool. First, Colossal believes that reviving the mammoth will assist in reducing carbon. The theory is that their movement on the tundra surface will compact the snow, insulating the cold to prevent the permafrost from thawing. The thawing of the permafrost is what scientists find most concerning about climate change. The NOAA Arctic on November 22nd, 20, 2019 reveals that the permafrost, especially in the tundra, stores as much as 1,600 billion tons of carbon. If thawed, this would not only increase atmospheric CO2, but would cause an immense amount of damage in a way similar to how potholes form. The NRDC on June 26, 2021 reveals that tens of millions of dollars in damages are estimated to occur in Canada and Alaska because of this thawing. However, if scientists can preserve the permafrost, then we wouldn't have to worry about destroyed cities being added to the problem that is climate change. Second, Colossal believes that this technique could be a beneficial restoration tool. The World Wildlife Fund reveals that the rate of extinction in 2021 was 10,000 times faster than normal because of humans. As a result, the World Economic Forum on January 4th, 2023 reveals that 41,000 species have already been added to the IUCN's endangered species list, with more soon to be added. But de-extinction could provide the information to make saving these creatures easier. The National Geographic on September 13, 2021 reveals that the Asian elephant shares nearly 100% of its DNA with mammoths. 
If scientists can revive the mammoth, then they could have the groundwork necessary to begin growing or reviving the elephant population. One day, we could live in a world where no one remembers the meaning of extinction. Like all new technology, de-extinction is hardly lacking in critics. From finances to ethics, many critics believe that this technique could increase the rate of extinction instead. Two prominent implications that display this are the general public not caring about endangered species and scientists prioritizing revived ones. First, Newsweek on February 2nd, 2023 argues that people won't care about endangered species anymore. If de-extinction is successful, we risk the public viewing it as a viable restoration tool. Poaching can become more prevalent if not legal, zoo conditions could get worse, and hunting or fishing for sport could become excessive. One day, extinction could be as common as a storm. However, that would throw the planet out of balance, increasing the rate of it becoming inhabitable unless evolution were to bring it back to equilibrium. But that could take hundreds, if not millions, of years to accomplish, ultimately leaving a desolate planet that should have had billions of years left. Second, scientists may become too focused on reviving species. The New Republic on December 15th, 2022 reveals that since this is a new technology, there are no laws regulating de-extinction. Therefore, there is nothing preventing scientists from doing whatever is necessary to revive their desired species, including sacrificing endangered ones. Popular Science on February 27, 2017 describes research in New South Wales with their extinct species. With the five species that were studied, scientists were able to determine that their resurrection would strip conservation funding for 42 living species. Reintroduction of these species could also make them invasive. CNN in September 2023 reveals that invasive species have been linked to 60% of extinctions. Scientists claim that de-extinction is here to help animal preservation. But how well will that work if they're sacrificing endangered species in the process? De-extinction sounds like it was pulled from a novel, but in all actuality, it is something that could become reality. After analyzing its background, advantages, and implications, all that's left to determine is whether it is worth it. Seeing a living, breathing mammoth one day would be a dream. But is it worth sacrificing endangered species if it's not even guaranteed to work? Richard Fluke was the last known person to see Martha alive before his passing in 1988. But our skies could be filled with these birds again. As long as we play the cards right. Please join me in thanking the team and wishing them good luck. Thank you. Thank you.